Well, welcome back to our third session in our uh, eighth grade painting unit. Uh, if you were keeping up with the instruction in the last session, uh, you should have something that looks very much like what you see in front of you right now. Uh, although I have not yet uh, drawn in any hands on my clock, I will get to that at some point in time. Uh, today's task is mainly to finish up the drawing and get our painting surface here uh, cleaned up and prepared so that we can begin to do some painting and I want to draw a, a little bit of additional material in here as well. Uh, traditionally whenever you have a scene such as this you have something in the foreground, the midground, and the background. So in this case we have stuff in the uh, foreground which would be our um, uh, our objects and our subject matter right here and we have stuff in the background such as the window and the clock as well and the wall but we're missing stuff really from the midground of all of this and uh, I think that that should go in here behind our stand for our cake or our cheese and we're just going to really just make the indication that there might be a chair uh, in behind the table here that's really all we're going to try to do so we need to make some ellipses at first and we also need to figure out precisely how our chair is going to be curved and so in this case I think what we're going to be able to see about the chair is probably about right in here so if we were to draw a curve that comes down from here and then a corresponding curve of almost the same curvation over here what this is going to be is the uh, backrest of our chair. I may have to fix this a little bit more so it takes up about a uniform amount of space as the other side. Now, uh, let's see, erase this out of here carefully. All right, so uh, as you're probably aware by now, there's always a continuous uh, series of erasings and uh, corrections that we make constantly when we make these drawings. So if we can do this rather quickly, we will be able to move on to actually clean up work and then some painting. All right, so this would be the back rail of the backrest of our chair. We're going to do another one about right here as well, and it should match this one. So if you were leaning against the back of the chair, you would be leaning against this portion of it. And this should be pretty much straight up and down with each other over here almost like a stripe. Now you'll notice too, I did spend some time off camera uh, bolding up my lines. I used a colored pencil for that so you can see more accurately what I'm doing and it won't smudge quite so uh, badly when I start uh, trying to clean it up and paint on it. Okay, now, what we're going to do now is at the top of this we're going to draw an ellipse right here. and we want to do the same thing over here and they should be almost exactly the same size if you really need to take a ruler and reference the top of this ellipse and then you can transfer that kind of uh, measurement over to here so our ellipse should be that they should be almost precisely the same size the effect we're attempting to get here is that the chair is pushed up against the table or pushed into the table pushed under the table there and so we're looking at it straight on, not foreshortened. Okay, so if we've got something that looks similar to that, then we can, so we've got these two ovals or egg shapes over here. Now we're simply going to draw a, a rounded portion of the top, and that will go all the way behind the table. We'll go simply straight down and disappear behind the table. Do the same thing over here. And they should be symmetrical, meaning they should be lining up with each other. See, we can go from here now and index over to here as to where that should start, and it should be right in here. So we want to curve that and draw a line straight down. Same thing over here. So it's curved at the top where it meets the ellipse, and then it's straight down. It's almost a cylinder of sorts. Alright, now where these two come together needs to be similar to this, so we're just going to keep bumping those lines a little bit until we can get almost exactly the same creation that we have on the other side. Now, so we've got the side rails of our chair, and we've got one back rail, so we would probably be able to see an indication of yet another rail behind that. 
or underneath it. So what we would have is a backrest, a space, and yet another uh, rail for the backrest. And that's all we should be able to see in this picture. Now we could fancy that chair up a lot more, uh, but my intention is to keep this as simple as possible. So now I'm going to go around, I'm going to bold these lines with a colored pencil. You don't necessarily need to do that, but for the purposes of this demonstration, it's probably a good idea for me. Okay, and then I will simply go back and erase all my stray pencil markings out. And uh, I think we're going to be pretty close to ready to start painting this, so we'll clean it. And then before the end of the session, we may be applying a little bit of paint here. You are going to need red, yellow, blue, black, and white paint. And I don't know if I wrote that down or not, but you're going to need a... And what I'm drawing on right now is 12 by 16. So that looks pretty good. I think I'm going to leave that alone. So what do we need to do this painting? We are going to need the following. You're going to need a 12 by 16 paint uh, painting board. And the following items for paint. You'll need a uh, the red. It should be acrylic if you can get it. Some sort of yellow. Of course, blue, and then you'll need some black and white paint. Now, the thing is, uh, you will also need a brush, you know, your utensils. So, you'll need a brush, rinse water, and you will need paper towels in order to get this keep this clean. Now if you're, uh, it doesn't really matter what kind of paint you get, but some paints are more difficult to use than others. So if you, you're using uh, varnishes and enamels, you will have real cleanup problems. If you're using acrylics that can be cleaned up with soap and water, that's what I would recommend. If you have tempers, you could also use those paints as well, but just a little set of poster paint would be enough to do the job. Okay, now let's get around and clean all of this up. If I could find my pencil I was just drawing with a moment ago, I'd be so happy. Here we go. So uh, we got to really uh, aggressively clean up uh, any of the pencil marks that are still present on here. Now you got to be careful not to smear anything around if you can avoid it. This uh, material, this graphite, is very smudgy and it's also very slippery and that's why we have to spend time cleaning the surface that we're going to paint because the graphite will interfere with the uh, paint's ability to grip the or, or glue itself down to the uh, surface that we're painting on and in the case that I'm using is a canvas board uh, you may be using illustration board or you may even be using uh, like a poster board or a piece of cardboard would work uh, it might be a little bit more difficult to work with. However, I have successfully made paintings on cardboard, and so uh, there is no reason why you couldn't use it. Uh, you may have to put more than one coat of paint on it in order for it to uh, look attractive. I don't wonder what that is. I don't recall that being on there in the last session. I must have smudged it with some sixth grade paint. Let's just clean this up a bit, but it is looking pretty good. Uh, so in a moment here, I'm going to get out some paint of my own, and uh, I'm not going to have a full card of paint in this case to start with. I really only want to uh, paint in the solid colors uh, of things to begin with, and in this case, that's going to really be um, the probably the space in the window in the background, and then we will talk about color mixing, which we will have to do uh, before we can continue to make the painting. Okay, let's see. Let's keep on dusting and keep your hands off of this if you can. This is the smudgiest part I can see in here. This is pretty smudgy too. 
So the cleaner and brighter the board is before we start with it, the less pollution it will put into your colors as they're put on. Uh, that really has a big impact on the outcome of the painting. So I know it sounds crazy, but before you even put any paint onto something, you have to do a lot of preparatory work, and that's what we're doing right now. Uh, so the sketch, uh, the cleaning of the surface a bit, dressing it up so that it's ready for to accept the paint rather than you know a filthy paint surface that will nothing will stick to. Or if it does stick, it will have chunks of eraser and pencil lead and graphite all in it and that will uh, be detrimental to its you know, beauty. Okay, so here we go. Let's just keep looking around for smears. Smudges. And carefully remove them where we find them. Old portions of layout work can go if you can clean them out of there without, you know, making a complete mess of your work. But I'm feeling pretty confident about this going along here. All right, fantastic. Uh, and I had to draw with a pretty heavy touch, so your drawing should be significantly easier to clean than mine is. However, uh, you know, some people draw with a very heavy hand, and if that's you, you're going to have to spend more time cleaning up. Okay, let's see what happens when I dust it. We get a, a brighter surface on which to paint. I want to say that's much better already. All right, well, that looks pretty good, ladies and gentlemen. So. Okay, now uh, I'm going to take a moment here to uh, get out my, uh, I'm just going to start with some blue paint. And then if it's necessary, I will uh, get some more paint, and uh, it is close at hand, and I need to uh, get going on this here. So we're going to start, really, uh, and we build up colors uh, when we make paintings, even though we are going to be mixing our own colors in this case, too. Uh, but we do have to just get into the groove of the idea that uh, we're going to have to mix some colors here. So you're going to need some rinse water, uh, maybe a, some, uh, maybe a, two rinse waters, one for diluting uh, things with, and perhaps another one for uh, cleaning out the actual paint brushes. Uh, if you do go that route, and that's perfectly fine, uh, then you should definitely have plenty of paper towels around so that you uh, can clean up your paintbrush thoroughly. But furthermore, you need to put a little bit of soap in that cleaning water, is what I'm trying to get at here. Uh, so when we do that, it helps break up the surface tension of the acrylic paint, and that causes it to be um, much easier to take out of the brush. Uh, acrylic paint has really powerful adhesive in it, and that powerful adhesive uh, gets in the brush as well and, and causes lots of trouble. All right, so we're going to go ahead and start with just this area in the back here. And we're just going to simply paint it blue to begin with. And we may go back and put other colors over top of it when we mix them up. Now, if you are concerned about uh, messing up your painting, then we should uh, you know, use a cover, sl a slip sheet here so that you don't mess up your painting if you're concerned about that. So make sure your brush is clean and is dry before you start using it. Uh, it's important to, uh, to keep the paint from getting diluted if you can avoid it. Uh, that does definitely interfere with, first of all, its opacity. And the opacity is a huge important part of painting. And so if you dilute the paint too much, meaning you don't dry out your brush, it's got too much water already in it, then what is going to happen is it will not stick to the surface and the opacity of it will look, uh, won't, won't have any 
it'll look like a kid did it instead of like somebody that's in an art class did it. So you've got to really learn to dry that brush uh, between color changes and uh, any time that you rinse out a paintbrush, you've got to really just you know squeeze the, the polluted water out of it. And then we are only using the finest point of the brush here. So uh, you can always put more paint onto a painting, but man, once it's on there, you're kind of stuck with what you did. And so, in my opinion, as a teacher and an artist myself, is that you know you can use small amounts of paint and add it up, and you get end up with a lot of amounts of paint. If you try to just you know think act like you're painting a house, an actual house, not a picture of a house. Uh, you want to use more paint for sure, but you don't have the control issues that you would have in a fine art painting. So my advice is to start with small amounts, less than you think you'll use, and then dial it up if that's what you need. Uh, my best advice in the other direction is don't try to paint a painting like you're painting a house. Um, just be patient. That's really important, not just in painting, but in life. So art is really just a communication about something about life. In this particular instance, you can interpret that almost any way you want. However, uh, this painting is really simply an exercise. And uh, in the exercise, we put in um, all of the techniques that were discussed in the lecture on painting that I made you take notes over. And this exercise includes all the different types of brush strokes, it includes all the different knowledge of various types of paint and the surfaces on which you paint called supports. And so when you're done with this painting, just like when you were done with the 6th grade and the 7th grade paintings in previous classes, previous grade levels, you will have not just learned about the vocabulary and the terminology of painting, but you'll have learned about the theory of it, and furthermore, you'll know more about how um, it's applied and actually done through technique. Uh, so, And then we review uh, and we have a quiz, right? All of that stuff happens in a unit, uh, because that's how you learn things. And so in this case, we're simply learning it by doing it. We're applying what was in the lecture and the note-taking. So that's how uh, education, especially in the arts, has traditionally been done. All right, this nice cobalt blue that I'm using right here is uh, really quite opaque. It's uh, I'm pretty satisfied with it. Cobalt is a element on the periodic table of elements. An eighth grader should know something about that by now. And uh, it, when it is processed in a certain manner, it gets a uh, bluish color to it that is permanent. It doesn't change colors it wants, it, if it, you know, it gets wet or, or if it gets. Um, gets too hot or anything like that, once it's processed, that cobalt carbonate is a rich blue color. And based on the concentration, that's how much of it is put into the paint, it can be either a, uh, a light blue color, similar to what we see here, more of a royal blue, I suppose. Uh, and then there, it can also be almost a violet, a violet color. Violet, violet color. It's also used in, um, in pottery glazes as well. So the stuff you paint on pottery that makes it colored and shiny also uses cobalt compounds to achieve kind of some um, rose colors and some... It, it does a lot of different things based on extreme heat and pressure inside the kiln, which is thousands of degrees sometimes. Alright, so see, this is just patience is all it is. And we're only on the third session, and we're already painting.
so see. Just a little bit of patience really, really pays off big time. So, if you're making this lesson up, then you can see that just the drawing itself took two days. Well, maybe two and then a portion of another day, in fact. So, there's really no easy way around this. Kids have tried to do all kinds of easier things, but there, uh, there is really only one way to learn this, and that's through instruction and uh, practice and application. Uh, some people do have just natural born talent, and that's there's that's they've got talent. There's nothing we can say about that. Uh, they just have a natural knowledge of how to use the materials. Some people are that way. Or they have been, you know, uh, working with these materials, paint and drawing utensils and such, since they were little children. And that's my experience, is that as a child, even though we didn't have elementary school art, as I recall, we did do art activities, but we didn't have an elementary school art program. Um, but from a young age, I enjoyed making drawings and paintings, and it wasn't a chore to me to do it. It was something that I did to pass time and to uh, work on my skills because I was encouraged at it as a young child. And as a result of that, I, I gained my skills at a younger age than a lot of people do, but I did not have my first uh, legitimate art lesson until I was in seventh grade art. Miss Louise Leibold, who was the art teacher that year. Who was the art teacher for many years, in fact. That she uh, got sick and passed away in the middle of the ninth grade year when I was a child. It was very saddening. Um, she was a well, well liked teacher. And I hope wherever you're at, Ms. Leibold, today, if you're hearing that, it makes you smile because uh, middle schoolers. Maybe a, maybe difficult to work with, Ms. Leibold, but you make a difference in their lives somehow or another. And uh, I still talk about you today out of respect and reverence for what I learned from her. She also gave me my very first attention for, <laughs> for a bit of vandalism, I guess, is what she would have called it. So maybe we'll talk about that sometime. Alright, so this is calming, quiet work. A lot of times you can actually hear the paint being applied onto the canvas. If you're in classes, uh, adult classes of course too, sometimes in middle school classes, but if you're in adult classes, it is really, really quiet and we'll paint for hours at a time and it is just really quiet and calming. But you can hear the sound of the paint brushes scraping against the canvas as we work on it. It's really smelled paint thinner. It's really interesting. So most young people would call that boring. We call it peaceful and productive. Alright, well it looks like we're closing in on being done with the window, at least our first base coat of it. We may go back and build up some uh, a little bit of character on it uh, as we block everything in. Uh, it is a misconception about paintings that you just paint them in like a coloring book. Uh, you really paintings, legitimate paintings are built up in layers and either the artist gets to a point where there's just nothing else that can be done to it without taking away from the beauty of it or um, they just run out of some sort of time or ideas. Uh, and so the layers are built up and built up and built up until you have a densely created piece of artwork. And acrylics are particularly good for this because of the glue that is in them. Uh, a painting you might do that way with oil paint it looks really very attractive. It just takes a really, really long time between sessions and so if you're going to build up layers of oil colors, a practice called glaze painting, uh, it, you work on it for a 
you know, a period of time, and then you have to put it aside and let it dry out. And then the next time that you pick it up, maybe a week later, then you add another thin coating of paint on top of it, and you just continuously do this until the painting is completed. Uh, the Mona Lisa is an example of that type of a painting where it was done by Renaissance master. And it, it's just built up in very thin, almost transparent, see-through layers that are just barely, barely given any color. And then after many, many layers, uh, that color builds up and is almost like looking through stained glass at some level. Okay, that looks pretty good, ladies and gents. Out there. E-learning land, or if this is a makeup lesson, out where you're at. Okay, well that looks pretty good. Now it looks like I may literally have to uh, pick up another color here, uh, and that's okay. So uh, I'm just really not in the mood to get out a whole bunch of paint and then have to chuck it out uh, right away. So I am going to get out some yellow and some red now at this point in time, and uh, I may uh, have to do a little bit of color mixing here in a few minutes. And that's uh, one of the things we did in the sixth grade lesson. And so none of this should be a big surprise to any eighth grader, I wouldn't think. All right. Now, also, with a little bit of black and white on your card as well, we can uh, do a little bit of tinting and shading also. So I'll put a little black on there, a little white, excuse me. And you, as you're probably fully aware, and I hope you are, it doesn't take much black to ruin a color. So. Uh, give yourself small amounts of black paint. You don't really need a whole uh, gallon of the stuff to do what we have to do here. Okay, now, let's see what we got. This is uh, my paint card currently, and if you were in the, um, if we were together in the actual physical classroom, uh, you would have a paint card like this uh, before we started the painting. Now, there's a couple things uh, that we can work on here and we can use pure color for that. The uh, edge of our cake, or if you want to call it cheese, that's what I'm, I'm thinking of it as, is going to be red. So this, this little outline around it and the top portion of it is going to be red. So I'm going to pick up some pure red on the tip of my brush and I'm going to start with that little outline. That tiny stripe right there. So and you just cannot really press down too hard on the paintbrush. If you do, you're going to lose any level of control that you got by steering that tiny little bead of paint around. So the bead is that tiny little drop of paint on the tip of the brush. And if you're really careful about how you apply that, then that bead, which indicates that it's kind of round, can be steered on the end of the brush and you can get pretty good control. Now this paint can get, especially acrylic paint, once it starts drying out it can get really gooey and gluey and clumpy as well. And uh, so you kind of got to work with more fresh paint, I suppose. Uh, only, you know, get out what you think you're going to need and if you need more then you get out fresh paint because when this paint dries and skins over and gets a film on it, it's really not very easy to use. It'll last about two class periods in uh, the physical classroom. However, uh, what we're uh, doing right here, you know, I'm sitting next to a projector and the projector is putting out some heat and that heated air is blowing around in here and it's going to dry my paint out pretty quick and film it over. Alright, now, I am using just a 6th grader's paintbrush, by the way, uh, to make my cheese. Now, our, our, above this, the other portion of this, this will be slightly lit because light's coming in through the window, and so that we can actually see that corner and maybe an indication of this little round edge right there, which might be a little darker. We might need to use some black in that. Let's take just a tiny bit of the red and set it off on the sidelines, maybe two little dips over here, and then just a dot of that white and mix it together. So it's kind of a, a dark pink, maybe a little bit more. 
So you want to be able to see a definite color change between the top of the cheese, there we go, that's what I'm looking for, and the outline that we just used. Now I'm going to take that pinkish color, and it should be like dark pink, like a carnation pink, I suppose. And that's going to go in the top of this. Very, very carefully tuck these colors together. Now that pencil line on your drawing, your paint should kind of melt that just a little bit. And it might actually even put that little dark edge right in there for you. And uh, it's a good thing if you can make it happen. Alright, so I'm trying to get that tight control right up there on that wedge of cheese, that corner right up there. So what we're uh, attempting to do is make the drawing and the color combination seem logical to people. And so uh, if we kept the same red on every surface, then we would lose the three-dimensional nature of that surface. So in the seventh grade project, painting project if you recall, we uh, always painted the front of the building a different color than the sides of the buildings, than the streets and the sidewalks. And what that effectively helped us do was to be able to see the details inside the picture. That's all that was all about. Okay, now, and uh, I'm going to take just a dot of black and mix it in with this. And maybe I can get, I'm just looking, I may need a little bit more red. Yet a little more red. Maybe a little more red now. So I'm just trying to get a dark red color. Just dark enough so that if I can see this edge of the cheese poking out from behind my wedge, that I can just very lightly scribe a little dark area in there so it looks like there's a shadow being cast on that one. Come on now. I'm going to quit messing with that. No, I'm not. Now I'm committed. Now I've got to mess with it. Okay, that looks better. Okay, so it looks like I've got like a red velvet cake or something going on here. But that's okay. Um, uh, when we clean it up a little bit more and we add some different colors, we'll be good to go. All right, now let's move on with other, you know, uh, easy colors. Uh, now we all know a banana, of course, is yellow, right? So we'll just go ahead and paint our banana in yellow. And because of the uh, material that we use to draw it with, the banana uh, should actually pick up some of that pollution a bit there behind it, and it will darken our, our yellow a bit. Uh, we're trying to avoid it turning green, and so if you were to mix yellow and black together uh, for some reason, you get green. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but that's what happens. So it's a, an occupational hazard there when we're making paintings. However, a banana, you know, is not this brilliant, bright, primary yellow color. A banana is actually a uh, kind of a, a toned down yellow. It actually probably has a little bit of brown mixed in with it. So uh, it's more of a Turner yellow. Is I guess specifically what I would call the color, um, and that's a, there's many different types of yellows, reds, browns, of course, all of these colors have got different names to them, specific, you know, traditional names, uh, and so Turner Yellow is more the actual color of a banana, uh, but we're going to achieve that yellow color by probably uh, putting a little bit, you know, of a variation of brown in here at some point in time to make it look a little bit more uh, natural. Now, almost nobody's going to mistake what they are looking at for uh, some other type of fruit if it's yellow. However, uh, if it's poorly drawn, it could be thought of as a squash or something, I suppose. pretty quickly here. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. Well, let's just keep on painting. Alright. Let's come around. You know, and if you 
paint right over that division line. This yellow is is weak enough. Most yellows are that you can uh, cover that up a bit, but it still shows through, and it should that pencil edge should darken your yellow just a bit. Now the stem on the banana, of course, at some point in time will be kind of brownish black or something. But at this point, we're simply just going to put in a little bit of yellow so we don't inadvertently paint over top of our banana stem. Then it starts looking not like a banana anymore. To this right there. Now I think in some of the time we got remaining, <coughs> we might just go ahead and start mixing up a little bit of green, and that green is going to uh, be on the pear. Uh, now pears come in a variety of different colors, of course, but uh, in this particular case, I think green is the appropriate color for this. So we're going to use our mixing card or maybe we can just use the index card we're working on. If we were doing a physical classroom I'd have you mix your colors on a separate card and uh, in this case I might just do that anyway. So I'm going to mix up some green there. So it usually takes about three of these yellows and it takes just a little bit of this oh period is over just about the time I got my green going. Alright I'll try to paint in that uh, Pair real quick here. Now you gotta when you're mixing up your paint, you gotta like treat it like it's a pile of sand, and you're just scraping the paint together with a tiny little, a little uh, uh, broom, I guess. Now into this, why don't we just take a little dot of this white and just add it in there and see what happens? Makes it look not quite so John Deere green. That's a little bit more attractive green. Okay, maybe one more dot of the white. Yeah, that's very good. Okay, so uh, make sure your brush is clean enough to get the work you got to do here done. And uh, let's take that kind of a soft green color and work that right in, right up next to the lines of our pear. Being careful not to paint over, you know, other portions of the painting. So a lot of this is about, you know, control. And that's probably the number one distinguishing difference between uh, someone who has experience and knowledge of how to make a painting work and someone who is, a, I would just say, a novice. And uh, a novice is not a bad thing, it's simply an experience. And so until you have that level of experience and you have made a few mistakes, strangely, you probably struggle with the whole idea of painting a bit. It's the application, it's the technique that really drives people crazy. Okay. And this will be the final thing we do today. try to make a small indication in between some of these uh, stems for my grapes that there is still, you know, you should be able to see between those so that you can see this, the pear itself also in those small voids. And uh, that kind of uh, detail work is what really makes the painting more attractive, more uh, logically believable as well. Okay, let's see if I can get just some money into the brush here and just touch the tiniest area here and then here and then also right here and uh, here, where is it? There it is. Alright. Well, that's pretty good. Let's see what we got there, ladies and gentlemen. We'll remove our paint from this, and uh, I say that's looking like we've got a painting going already. Uh, so uh, make sure you clean up your materials and clean out your brush. You'll need it on the next session. We will just continue painting until we finish this thing, or we run out of we run out of time. 
And so I hope you're getting the kind of results that you like. I hope you're getting at least results like what you see in front of you here. And if you are, I think you're going to have a really successful painting. If you're not, you need to rewatch the videos and practice a little bit more off camera and participate with everything you got while you're in the classroom. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's been a good session. I will talk to you in the next one. Have a good day.